Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Stay at Home. My name is Bhaskar Sankar. I'm the editor and publisher of Jackman Magazine. And I've been joined since the start of the pandemic uh, a few times a week with a left wing thinker. Normally, we've been just doing a straight lecture for around 25, 30 minutes. Uh, but this time, we're doing something a little bit different. We're doing a debate for just the second time. And um, today, we have uh, Christian Parenti who is a longtime Jacobin contributor. Uh, he's the author of a new book the, uh, called Radical Hamilton, Economic Lessons from a Misunderstood Founder. He's the author of many other books, including Tropic of Chaos, Climate Change, and the New Geography of Violence. And uh, I think his Hamilton book started, or at least the first thing he published on it uh, was um, it a Jacobin piece that you should also check out, uh, which is kind of a, a prelude to the book that I just recently started, but I will finish by, I believe, September 16th, which is when um, he's doing a lecture on this channel on the topic of his, his book. So you might just associate Hamilton with a somewhat overrated musical and um, the political projections of liberals. But in fact, Hamilton was a very interesting uh, figure, one that has lessons for those of us interested in state development um, and many other things. And, and there's perhaps a Hamilton, a reading of Hamilton uh, that, that we could draw from the left. Uh, he might not be as easy to do so as you know Thomas Paine or figures like that, but I think Christian makes a very compelling case. I'm also joined by Lee Phillips, who's a regular contributor to Jacobin. Uh, Lee uh, is the author of uh, People's Republic of Walmart, uh, which he's a co-author with Michal, um, another Jackman contributor. And he's also the author of Austerity, Ecology, and the Collapse Porn Addicts. I want to make sure I got that title right. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, what Did you come up with that title? Or was that a zero books? Was that? Um... No, that was totally, totally my awful title. Okay. Okay. Um, I generally don't like uh, let myself title my own my own uh, my own works. I leave it to marketing departments, so I have plausible deniability. But um, Lee Lee is uh, is I think generally someone who agrees with Christian on most things. Um, uh, I think they're they're quite similar when you when you read their their takes on free speech on a lot of these uh, polarizing issues on the left. They come down on the same side. That's why I really want to get them here debating. And I want to keep the format a bit lively. Um, I've appreciated how many people have been tuning in to these uh, lectures that are sometimes just the same person talking for 40, uh, 45 minutes. But this time, we're going to do a little bit of a different format. We're going to have Lee talk for around 10 minutes, making the affirmative case, a defense of, of nuclear power as part of the vision of the left. Then we're going to have a Christian give the uh, negative. Uh, then I'll let them respond to each other a bit. I'll facilitate a a uh, short round of follow-up questions. And if we have decent questions for the comments, uh, which I'm sure we will, uh, we will do some Q and A. Um, and in the meantime, please do um, press like, press subscribe, um, support the channel that way. Um, you know, we really just rely on your support through your subscriptions. We're not really asking you for money to keep the channel going because I know many of you already subscribed to Jacobin, but uh, please do share these uh, videos because we put uh, quite a bit of time into them. Uh, Kale Brooks, our producer has, and obviously our guests are giving their, their evenings to this as well. So without further ado, Lee, please go ahead for around 10 minutes and then Christian mm -hmm. will, will follow. Sure thing. Actually, you know, honestly, just want to uh, underscore there what, what you said about debating with, uh, with Christian. Um, I loved his his piece on Hamilton in uh, in Jacobin uh, a couple of years ago, and I can't wait uh, to read this book, uh, particularly because I'm so interested in the role of, of of government and industrial policy and economic planning to uh, for the purposes of economic development. All right, so uh, let's get to it. So in the last uh, couple of weeks, there's been sort of three. Um, quite important developments with respect to climate change and, and energy uh, that I think uh, everybody really needs to be uh, keeping front of mind at, uh, with respect to this. So there was a paper uh, that came out in Nature in August um, that uh, basically discussed how the snow that normally makes up for the melt the, uh, of ice from Greenland's glaciers each year is no longer making up for that melt. Uh, put another way, 
um, uh, basically this is it. So that uh, in the absence of some uh, geoengineering uh, ability to refreeze ice and put it up there, that's it. Um, that um, ice cap is now melting. It's going to take a long time uh, for that to fully melt, but it, it's that all of those those many meters, things about seven meters of, of, of sea level rise that will happen as a result of the Greenland, Greenland uh, ice sheet melting is going to happen. Um, you know, the same month uh, we saw in California a heat storm um, and accompanying devastating wildfires. Uh, we should be very careful uh, not to say that any one incident um, is caused by climate change. Um, and it's important to recognize the role of often sometimes irrational fire suppression uh, efforts that, that have happened in that uh, state for, for decades uh, that, is also, that also contribute to this. But at the same time, we also know that the overall trend is that climate change is already causing increased frequency, intensity, and extent of wildfires, all other things being equal, and this is going to continue. So it's, you know, it's clearly a climate emergency. Um, yet California um, has been amongst uh, one of the, uh, the, the nation's biggest supporters of renewable energy, um, producing some 30% of the state's electricity now. And so it seems great, right? Um, but at the same time, it's also been closing nuclear plants, which are low carbon, um, in many respects, lower carbon um, than uh, most solar and wind um, um, uh, projects. Uh, which is not so great. Um, in 2012, Southern California Edison closed the San Onofre uh, Nuclear Generation, Generating Station, or SONGS, removing a whopping 2,200 megawatts off the grid. This is clean energy. And uh, the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Generating Station is also scheduled for closure. Uh, the result during the wildfires and this terrible heat storm when people need air conditioning the most um, has been rolling blackouts. So, you know, anybody who's a big supporter of 100% uh, variable renewables like wind and solar really should pause now and say, well, this is a real world um, sort of example. And this is, this is what happens when we don't have um, um, clean electricity available 24 seven. Uh, just very quickly, I wanted to say that um, while I'm going to be making the uh, defense of nuclear, I, I wasn't always a nuclear supporter. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a lefty. It's a sort of like it's in the air as a lefty sometimes uh, that you're supposed to oppose nuclear. I wasn't like super opposed because I grew up between Pickering and Darlington uh, generating stations, like smack right between these two um, in Ontario. And I went to uh, Pickering generating plant as you know, with my Cub Scout troop. And I was, I was never really worried about radiation or meltdown. Um, and certainly as a science journalist, I knew that these were not the bogeymen uh, that the left sometimes thinks that they are. Um, but I was worried about nuclear waste. Um, and it took me a long time before I realized that actually waste isn't the, the issue that, that we think it is. Um, and that really is what changed my mind. And I think there was also, uh, it was the result of a number of really progressive figures like George Mambio, um, this great socialist and environmentalist campaigner in the UK who came out um, as pro-nuclear. Um, Mark Linus, another great um, lefty and um, environmentalist also is pro-nuclear. Um, um, it's been really impressive in the last little while to see the emergence of a new pro-nuclear climate movement um, uh, people like uh, Zeon Lights, who was the former science, uh, sorry, former uh, um, head uh, communications for uh, Extinction Rebellion in the UK, and she's a science communicator herself, and she got very frustrated with their anti-nuclear stance, and she has now uh, come out um, uh, in, in favor of nuclear, as has Joel Scott Halkas, who is uh, Extinction Rebellion UK's uh, former so um, action or, uh, organizer, uh, Bill McKibben um, of 350.org has admitted that we probably do need nuclear as part of the mix, but he's, he's scared about coming out forcefully in favor of it because he says um, that uh, he, he fears that he would split the environmental movement, the climate movement. Um, I personally know of people in, um, in places like Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, who privately are in favor of nuclear. They know that it has to be part of the mix, 
but again, are afraid of coming out um, in favor of it. Same with Sierra Club, NRDC. Um, in many respects, some of these organizations are afraid of losing donors. Um, uh, uh, in um, particularly in uh, fit, you know the Finnish Greens are now pro nuclear. Uh, there's a wonderful new um, um, pro nuclear organization that's headed by uh, young women who um, are progressive and absolutely recognize this are sometimes sexist aspects to pro nuclear advocacy. The nuclear bros online and are really really trying to for uh, forward and front. Um, 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 the, the sort of feminist take on and uh, and social justice take on on, on 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 nuclear power and all the power to them. Um, Alexander Ocasio Cortez now backs uh, nuclear, as do Jeremy Corbyn's uh, Labour Party, former Brazilian um, and uh, president and Workers' Party le uh, leader Lula da Silva uh, backs nuclear power, as does the socialist former president of Bolivia Evo Morales, who was toppled in a U.S. backed coup. Um, and of course, the build out of nuclear power in um, in France, where they basically complete almost completely decarbonized their grid um, in the 70s and 80s, uh, was under the leadership of the socialist um, uh, Francois Mitterrand, and of course, Sweden, which is also a nuclear power, uh, nuclear energy power that is um, uh, that was rolled out under its Social Democratic Party. So I just want to really stress that um, you don't have to assume that nuclear power is a conservative thing, it isn't. Um, it's just technology. Um, and the reality is that, you know, just as 97% of the scientists accept, accept the reality of anthropogenic global warming, you probably heard that, uh, that figure before, similar percentages of scientists accept the, uh, um, the need for, for nuclear power as part of the, uh, uh, the mix. That's certainly true within the energy systems community. Uh, so engineers and energy systems researchers. Um, to, so sort of to reject nuclear power um, is, is, you know, in a similar way, um, rejecting the, the evidence in the same way that um, sort of climate skeptics would reject the reality of um, anthropogenic global warming. Um, we can see that w from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, this collection of you know, thousands of climate scientists and uh, other associated climate-oriented scientists um, who produce um, every few years a, an update on the state of the climate and what we should do to, you know, what the best evidence is, as what we should do to to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And its most recent major report in 2018 has a list of four illustrative pathways, it's called illustrative pathways, um, uh, which is uh, uh, about how four different pathways, how we can keep within 1.5 degrees of warming by the end of the century. Every single one of them includes nuclear um, and uh, they assume anything up to a 500% increase in the global share of energy provided by nuclear, so not just electricity, energy, um, by 2050, if we are to stay within this 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 guardrail of warming. Um, uh, Kale, if you could throw up that uh, image um, of the the rates of decarbonization over history. No, not that one. Um, sorry. Yeah, that's the one. Awesome. If you look at that, that is a an analysis by Jameson McBride, a researcher with the Breakthrough Institute in California, an eco-modernist um, research uh, outfit. And he is also a democratic socialist, by the way. Um, and he came up with this, uh, this anal he, he did analysis of the fastest um, decarboniz decarbonization rates in history. And uh, given the speed with which we need to be decarbonizing, this is a very useful um, sort of metric to be looking at. And he found that the fastest decarbon decarbonization rate in history was 4.5% uh, per year by France um, in the roughly 10, 12 years that it took to build out its uh, nuclear um, um, program. Uh, the, all of the other ones there, it's very interesting to see that um, they are all state-led, and this is something I think Christian will really love, they're all state-led decarbonization efforts. Um, uh, where was I here? Um, there's a really great quote from, uh, from Jameson. Uh, actually, I just want to read. Each of the countries with the fastest historical declines in carbon intensity experienced a rapid clean energy transition led by the public sector. Four out of five countries uh, achieve these declines primarily by building large-scale clean energy generating projects, nuclear reactors, and hydroelectric dams. Um, and uh, uh, in, in sorry, uh, Saudi Arabia transitioned from oil to natural gas. So that's a, somewhat of a decarbonization, still not fully clean energy, obviously. Um, 
In this period, South Korea, Canada, and France were all varieties of social democracies, which viewed the nationalized expansion of clean energy as an explicit political goal rooted in commitments to equality, prosperity, and sustainability. I think it's a great quote from Jameson there. Um, all, if, uh, Kale, if you could just throw out the, the, that other one that you had a second ago. Um, yeah, perfect. So this is a, um, a chart of all of the eight major economies in the world that have already largely or fully decarbonized their electricity grids. This is amazing because you think, you know, there's so much farther we have to go. It actually turns out that there's eight pretty big economies that have already done it. Iceland has done this as well, but I'm not including it there because it just has, you know, 340,000 people. These are all, um, you know, many millions of people uh, in their economy. Um, France, Ontario, Quebec, Sweden, British Columbia, Norway, Paraguay, and Switzerland, they've all done this on, uh, depending uh, on nuclear and or hydro. Germany, meanwhile, okay, so thanks, uh, Kale. Uh, Germany, you know, gets all these hosannas um, uh, from many Greens for its energy venda or energy turn in which the country has spent a half a trillion euros um, on weather dependent renewables like wind and solar uh, using an awful neoliberal policy of feed in tariffs that work to redistribute wealth from the poor up to the middle class. Um, and while they're shutting down their, being shutting down their nuclear plants. This is resulting in some of the uh, most expensive electricity prices in Europe with some of the highest energy poverty rates. And for a few years there, emission, greenhouse gas emissions were actually increasing. Um, as it had, as Germany had to open new coal plants and coal mines. So, if you, uh, Kale, if you could throw up the uh, um, European map there of uh, greenhouse gas intensity. So, this is a map. If you can go, you can go on to. Uh, it's called energelectricitymap.org, uh, I think, or .com. Anyway, you can find it, um, and it shows you moment to moment uh, the energy intensity of anywhere in the world. Uh, this is a map of Europe from a few weeks ago, and as you can, and green, the greener it is, the cleaner it is, the the browner it is, the the dirtier it is. And as you can see, uh, France, Norway, Sweden, um, Finland are um, the, the clearly the, uh, the 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 cleanest uh, there. Um, there's also Iceland off in the left, but as I said, just 340,000 people. Uh, meanwhile, that that sort of light brown thing in the middle, that's Germany. Um, so, and the reason for all of this, the reason that this is a problem is basically the intermittency of wind and solar. The sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. Now, some on both the green left and actually the climate skeptic right argue that capitalism cannot run without fossil fuels because capitalism demands 24 seven energy, also called dispatchable. So you can have it any time um, to basically to run as a capitalism's factories. Well, socialism, including Medicare for all, also needs 24 seven energy. Uh, because you know when you're in the hospital, you don't want to wait for the wind to blow uh, in order to use a heart monitor. Um, as a science communicator, I've worked with uh, researchers on high altitude wind and floating offshore wind, uh, which radically reduces the intermittency, but it doesn't uh, go away, uh, uh, eliminate it. Um, um, I have worked with researchers on uh, wave energy, which is one of the, the least intermittent, uh, but still intermittent um, uh, renewable energy. So just just uh, 20 um, seconds, Lee. Yeah, yeah I, gave you, I gave you an extra couple, couple minutes, which I'll, I'll dock from the end of our, of our fake debate. But, uh, but I want to hear Christian's uh, counter. So why, I'll let you sum up. Why don't you sum up in, in 15, 20 sure. minutes? Okay. So uh, very quickly, from, why can't we just get batteries uh, to um, uh, fill up the gap? Because uh, they only store energy for, for uh, a couple of hours, and we need um, um, energy to be available for you know storage for like weeks on end uh, when the, the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't shining for a long period of time. There are three um, uh, clean sources of energy that are dispatchable. One is hydro, one is geothermal, the other is nuclear. Geothermal and hydro are only available in particular geographies. There's other issues with them as well, um, but nuclear is the only one that you can use anywhere. Lots of other issues, so, but that's a, a good place to end. So we'll, we'll hear from Christian now. So Lee's advocating, of course, Nuclear power is an, is an important part mixed in with renewables mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and other sources of energy. Uh, I think Christian will have some objections, particularly yeah. 
to your your timetable and the timetable to action. But uh, I'll let Christian, you can go ahead for as long as you want, 10, 15 minutes, uh, then uh, okay. I'll, I'll come with some shorter questions for both of you. After. Okay. Um, yeah, we got, we got mostly a litany of innocence by association and not a lot of hard facts. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about is about the actual cost of atomic power and why atomic power has not been uh, rising to the occasion. It's been 20 years now that, that this country, the United States, has officially been pursuing an atomic renaissance, a nuclear renaissance. In, in 2002, George Bush streamlined the licensing process and put eventually $18 billion in subsidies on the table. Obama increased that to around $43 billion, and 26 plants were proposed, and only one is currently under construction. And this is, the, this is the story of atomic power all throughout um, its history, is that it, it again and again promises these amazing things and fails to deliver. And the main reason is that it is fundamentally just too expensive. Peter Bradford, who's a former uh, NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission member, described fighting climate change with atomic power as being like trying to fight world hunger with caviar. And nukes are expensive in two ways. One, the direct costs, they just, they cost enormous amounts. And two, the opportunity costs, that the money they absorb and the time they take to uh, fail is all resources and time not devoted to other projects. So if, Cal, if you could put up that first graphic, this is Lazard, it's a mainstream, you know, it's a um, Wall Street analyst's. Uh, company, and this is their levelized cost of energy comparison, unsubsidized, right? And you see up here, I don't know if you guys can see it on my screen, it looks quite small, but um, it, you know, uh, photovoltaic on your rooftop, very expensive. Nukes, uh, it's gotten, oh, yeah, it's cut in two, I see. Nukes down here, if you go back up, you got, these are commercial scale solar voltaic, and this is, uh, more uh, so solar voltaic and wind down here, right? These are the price points, unsubsidized. Compare that to nukes. Certainly nukes beats photovoltaics. If you go back down, right? This is nukes. I don't know how that got broken up. But anyway, so this is why no new nuke plants are essentially being built in this country. And it's also why existing nuke plants are being closed. The reason that San Onofre in California was closed was not because environmentalists forced it because they were afraid of radiation or this or that, or because the climate plan mandated it. It's because the plant was only built to last 40 years and its steam turbine started to give out and Mitsubishi was contracted to replace this and it cost a hundred million dollars and Mitsubishi botched the job and Southern California Edison then got tangled up in a lawsuit with Mitsubishi and realized they were going to have to invest even more money in this plant if it was going to just generate electricity. And the price of energy being what it is, due in part to the rapidly falling price of renewable energies, particularly solar and wind, and also unfortunately due to the fracking revolution and the cheap price of natural gas, given those factors and deregulation, which is about uh, most of the country is semi-deregulated, which is a problem in many ways, but the reality is it makes the existence of nukes uh, very difficult, even old nukes, and it makes the creation of new nukes next to impossible. So they realized that in this context, they just couldn't compete. So that's why San Onofre was closed. Um, if you look at, if you could do the next slide, Cal. So this is a footnote. This is the footnote that accompanies that graph from Lazard about the unsubsidized, levelized cost of atomic power, right? And they say, Unless otherwise indicated, the analysis herein does not reflect decommissioning costs, ongoing maintenance-related capital expenditures, or the potential economic impacts of federal subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, decommissioning costs are, are an enormous cost that society burdens, uh, uh, um, takes, takes on as a burden. Uh, atomic energy companies that decommission plants play a, pay a flat fee, and then a lot of that actual cost accrues to the public. But the important part is the thing about maintenance, right? Even the, the upkeep of these existing plants is causing them to have to retire. 
This is the story of what happened to San Onofre, also to Vermont Yankee, and to most of the four or five plants that have closed recently in the US. So that's the situation. And this is also despite the fact that they've received up rates and they've had, uh, which is allowing them to produce at a kind of higher rate than they were originally licensed to produce at. If you could go, Cal, to the um, slide number six. Yeah, okay, so this is, this is a, a, just a graph of the direction of the capacity buildout of wind and solar. And that's fine. You can, the, uh, this is from the, from the US government. And in that accompanying document, it says, it doesn't quite match this number, but it says, because it's, it's lower what they write, they say that since between 2008 and 2018, 94 gigawatts of wind generating capacity were added. That is the equivalent of adding 34 Indian power atomic power plants, right? And in the meantime, uh, if you could go to the, I think it's number four, Cal. Yeah, so this is what has happened with the actual capacity and generation of atomic power in the US, right? You can see it's been flatlined since the mid 80s and nothing has happened. Now this entire time, we have been hearing people talk up atomic power. There have been major government subsidies put on the table for the last 20 years, as has finally just changed, but for the last 20 years, basically, the federal government was willing to pay 85% of the costs of a new atomic power plant and still, all we have to show for it is one new plant that came on that sort of was predated all this was the Watts Bar 2 reactor, which is government owned, part of TVA. And the Vogel uh, units three and four in Georgia. And this is the only new plant that is currently under construction in the US. The first two units of Vogel uh, ended up going into over 1,000% cost overrun. These two units that are under construction, three and four, were estimated to cost $14 billion. They are now going to cost at least $28 billion. That's the equivalent of the entire GDP of Iceland or of El Salvador. And in the 12 years that this project has been going, not a single iota of clean energy has been produced by this project. And when it comes online, if it comes online, it's going to be some of the most expensive energy in the country. The only reason that plant is being built is because it's in the Southeast, which is a region that was never um, deregulated. And so the utility gets to pass on the costs to the ratepayers, the customers. And there's also significant federal subsidies to that plant. Across the river in South Carolina, there was another plant attempted called the, um, the, the summer, the VC summer plant. And in that project, $9 billion was spent. Westinghouse went bankrupt and the plant was abandoned. And so nothing was achieved for $9 billion of both uh, public and private money. So this just illustrates the direct costs and also the opportunity costs. What could we have done with that $9 billion that was wasted in, on the summer plant? What else could we have done with the $29 billion that's being wasted on the uh, Vogel plant in Georgia? Could have built out a lot of clean energy. The fact of the matter is that renewable energy is dropping and uh, that's making it impossible. The price of renewable energy is dropping and that's making it impossible for new nukes to compete and even for um, current nukes, currently existing nukes. Um, in terms of battery, in terms of intermittency, intermittency is an issue, but there are solutions other than nuke plants and nuke plants, new nuke plants don't seem to be much of a solution at all because they don't come in on time. They're simply not being delivered, right? That's the main problem with them. They're too expensive. They make promises they can't keep and they don't show up. They don't deliver. So that's why they're, they're not a magic bullet for intermittency. There is um, battery storage the price of which has dropped by 80% over the last decade. There's also hydro storage, which is used even in fossil fuel um, resources where you just pump water uphill when you have energy and then you run it downhill from two different reservoirs, run it downhill when you 
don't have the generating capacity and you generate energy with a turbine. So there could be limits to the geography of that, but we have not uh, reached them at all. One of the adaptations to climate change is definitely going to require building new reservoirs. The snowpack in the Sierras, I mean, Lee began this with talking about snowpack, right? Well, California agriculture is going to have to do something other than, um, other than relying on snowpack as temperature warms. So there's going to have to be reservoirs built. We could build storage capacity into that. But the main thing is that the price of battery storage is dropping precipitously. And I have another slide that illustrates, yeah. Again, it's not the amount so much, but just this is the trend line. This is the, the you know, you can see the, the, the build out of this. So the idea that uh, nukes are the only solution to intermittency is just not true. Um, so, so Chris, I think about 10 can, minutes. can you wrap up in about yeah. a minute or so? Yeah. I mean, I just think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that pretty much, but just, to, I mean, I guess to say the final thing is in terms of the only way that nukes can be built out is if they are 100%, if the costs are 100% socialized. Cause the, the, uh, I mean, that's basically the story with, with China where there's, there was a new project of 27 plants, which has now been scaled back to 10. That's what the story of the French build out in the seventies. And even when you have 85% of the cost guaranteed, the private sector doesn't want to get involved with it because there are more profitable opportunities. Now, the situation, why that is important is because we cannot wait for socialism to arrive to start decarbonizing our economy. The time frame of climate science indicates that we have to start decarbonizing our economy now with these institutions and this existing technology. And this is an absolutely imperfect system and it would be really nice to have uh, the capacities of planning and subsidy that Lee is fond of imagining and I, I'm, I'm very supportive of going in that direction, but it is not okay to put off the task of decarbonization until those political conditions arrive. So I'll let Lee respond directly to any part of Christian's um, argument sure. for maybe, let's say five minutes, ideally less, I'll hold you strictly to the to the five minutes, but maybe also if I could point the the conversation in one in one direction. Uh, I do think the question of opportunity costs is an important one, right? So in other words, obviously we are not Austerians, but there is a certain amount of, of, of time, resources, energy, either in a, a material sense, um, that, that we can expect the state to immediately kind of redirect to, to clean energy, but also in terms of a political um, sense. So while we're fighting the battle over um, um, nuclear power, uh, we might end up, um, you know, being in a situation where we're uh, fighting a battle that has no real re relevance because in the US it'll take 20 years to generate and put on plants, you know, online anyway. Uh, then, Christian, for when you reply to Lee, because you could just jump in as soon as he's done, uh, I guess the question is, a lot of your argument relies on on contingent factors uh, about the U.S. and our and our system here. Um, what would you say about um, the successes? Contingent, I don't know what you mean by contingent. Well, contingent in terms of, you know, existing is what I would say. Well, factors about the U.S. and, and the way we've been producing um, um, energy. Uh, what would you say about existing plants in places like uh, France and 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 elsewhere, um, I do support kind of keeping them online and also kind of spending to to maintain them as as necessary. And also, I guess this this relates to countries like China and elsewhere that have shown the capacity to create relatively standardized models uh, and and produce buildouts that way. So, to what extent is this a argument about domestic priorities, and to what extent would you extend this broadly to countries that have greater state capacity? Uh, than the United States. But I'll, I'll let, you guys can totally ignore that too, but I'll let Lee go for five minutes and Christian, you can respond for five minutes. Then maybe we could take a couple questions from the, from the chat. Okay, so just very quickly, uh, batteries, again, I really wanna stress uh, the batteries that we have, even if they do come down in, uh, significantly in price, they're basically not really very different from the lithium ion batteries that are used in your, your laptop. So that means you've got basically about 10 hours there. Um, so, um, I mean, you can you, you can buy a car for five hundred dollars if you want, but um, it it might not always run, and so that's why you're going to spend twenty thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars on a car. It's the same thing here. Um, 
it's um, okay. Um, uh, so pump storage, yes, absolutely. In fact, let's just forget about uh, batteries for a second. Let's just talk uh, much easier, much cheaper, much lower carbon uh, way to store energy. Just very simply pumping water up the hill and let, uh, let it come back down when you when you, we need some some fresh energy. But here's the thing: if you've got the geography that it makes that feasible, if you and a lot of parts of the United States, you've already tapped that out anyway. Um, certainly Ontario did, which is why they actually switched to nuclear in the 70s and 80s, because they had like, basically dammed up all the rivers that could be dammed. Um, why don't you just do hydro anyway? Because hydro is like a far better, far cheaper um, um, uh, energy source that isn't, uh, that is clean and um, uh, not intermittent. But here's the thing, you can't build uh, pumped storage hydro any just anywhere. And then, and then additionally to this, we're concerned about the climate uh, climate crisis, but there's two environmental crises at the moment. The second one is the biodiversity crisis and the land footprint of energy storage, whether pump storage hydro or any other um, form of, 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 of energy diffuse uh, storage like that, it takes up so much land. Uh, the Site C hydroelectric dam that is currently being built in British Columbia, where I live, uh, takes up about 30,000, will, when it's built, take up about 30,000 acres. The same uh, amount of electricity production um, would take up, uh, if it were nuclear, you know, a small um, industrial park. Um, we, if we were to depend upon intermittent renewables or um, 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 dispatchable renewables like hydro, pump storage hydro, the amount of land that we would have to take up is just so vast, we would suddenly be uh, competing with land now. Uh, in a similar way, the biofuels compete with uh, agriculture for access to land. And the, the single biggest cause of, um, of biodiversity loss is land use change. So we would be solving climate change and accelerating the bio biodiversity crisis by doing that. Uh, let's talk about cost, right? The opportunity cost, um, uh, 13 billion plus 43 billion. Can't remember the exact numbers that, um, or rather I can't read what my handwriting there. Honestly, that's small potatoes. 550, like half a trillion, 550 uh, mil, uh, uh, and a billion euros, half a trillion euros were spent by Germany. So that's what um, what Christian is talking about. They're really a small potatoes. And what I find interesting here is that this effectively is a neoliberal argument because it's assuming that the, uh, the size of the pie cannot be enlarged. It's assuming that we can't increase taxes to be able to do this. But actually, you know, to be honest, uh, honest already, 500, the 550 um, uh, billion euros, that Germany could have done what France did. Um, and now they would have decarbonized their grid. So it's, it's, it's a false argument to say that uh, it's an opportunity cost here. There's, a, there's more than enough um, space in that pie for, uh, for renewables and for nuclear. And then uh, lastly, um, this issue of, uh, actually, let's just talk about this, what some of these numbers are in cost. So um, uh, uh, the, uh, Capco, the Korean energy uh, uh, company, which is publicly owned, by the way, um, has been building out uh, nuclear power plants, uh, 17 nuclear power plants since the 1990s, with uninterrupted. The problem basically in the West, particularly in the United States, is because of neoliberalism, we stop building stuff. We stop building large stuff. Um, uh, it's a, it results in the neoliberal fear of mega projects. Um, it, uh, Korea, which is less neoliberalized than the United States, managed to continue that process. And the what's what's useful about um, uh, continued uninterrupted um, uh, build-outs is this constant learning, which is where the cheapness comes from. Uh, so they built out uh, recently in the last eight years, they built out four units uh, for uh, 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 it, for the UAE, uh, the uh, United Arab Emirates, um, at, at a cost of uh, twenty point four billion. That's four 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 units. Um, the resulting uh, energy price is $50, $50 US per megawatt hour. Now, for comparison, offshore wind from the US Energy Information Office put offshore wind as of February this year um, at an average of 115. So let's, so 51 versus 115. So nuclear is like half as, uh, half as expensive as, as offshore wind. And offshore wind is basically our best option for the least intermittent uh, intermittent renewable, um, and um, so it's just and in terms of the um, 
delivering on time and on budget. It hit the, the budget uh, numbers and it took eight years or an average for four units. So an average of two years per unit. That is exactly the, uh, the speed that we need to be. Uh, uh, so, so, so we, we can, I, can I interrupt you with just one quick question before we go to Christian? So obviously cost in your argument isn't a fixed thing. It's, it's, it changes. So South Korea is able to decrease costs over time, but in this, along the same lines, cost um, as it relates to offshore wind, presumably could decline too, because cost for wind, um, you know, on land has Absolutely. been has been um, uh, declining. Like neither of these are, are, are fixed, we've had, we've had fixed the targets, of, and, but, and that's great. But we've had the learning of uninterrupted production of wind turbines and uh, solar panels for the last twenty years, supported by um, uh, enormous um, uh, public subsidies and and industrial policies, and that's great. That's exactly what we should be doing. That has not happened for, for nuclear. So um, uh, Christian said that there, you know, there is this, you know, uh, uh, atomic renaissance process of support. What the, the numbers, the penny, it's pennies that's being thrown at it. It's not an industrial pro uh, policy in the way that um, uh, wind and solar have uh, seen that level of support. So, so we, we, we would have even cheaper um, uh, nuclear if, uh, if if we had a dose of socialism, basically. So, uh, Christian, why don't you go ahead for for five minutes or so, yeah, and then uh, then we'll uh, get to a couple. Of I things. mean, what, you know, what, you, you're just kind of making stuff up here, Lee. What there, there's been there's been no support for atomic power. What are you talking about? Eighty five percent of the costs have been covered by loan guarantees. There hasn't been learning. We've been making atomic power plants since the fifties. I mean, what are you talking about? Wind, wind, offshore wind is just now developing. Certainly the prices will come down. And getting back to that Lazard graph that I showed you, which was unsubsidized, right? Wind and uh, commercial PV are just, uh, PV solar are just wiping out nukes. So the thing that the pro nuke side has to explain is why if this technology is, as they have been saying since the 50s, amazing, right? Remember this, this was, uh, this technology was rolled out with claims that it would be too cheap to meter. At first the idea was, oh, we're gonna have tiny nukes everywhere. That turned out to be impossible, totally expensive. Things weren't coming in correctly. Then it was like, okay, we're gonna have really big nukes. In the long run, only a fraction of all the nukes imagined were built and they have all been very, very expensive. And there has been, ample opportunity over the last 20 years for the atomic energy agency, I mean, for the atomic energy industry in this country to build out all sorts of nukes. We were promised in 2002, large numbers of nukes, thanks to the changes in licensing and due to new forms of technology. And it didn't happen. And this is what you guys have to explain. And there's always something new. Now the latest one is small modular reactors. Well, we've got one project of that that's being planned and moving forward with very considerable subsidy, around $4 billion worth of subsidy from the federal government. And just last week, several towns involved in this project pulled out because they realized that the price that they were gonna be locked in for was enormous. So this is not an abstraction. This is something you really have to deal with. Why is it that you can't deliver on these, uh, these amazing promises? And in terms of you know, the real cost of uh, these state-owned agencies, don't report the full cost. We don't really know what the full cost of France's build out in the 70s was. We do know that Flemingville, the current nuke plant they're building is behind schedule and above cost. We know that the, the finished nuke plant that's being built is above cost and behind schedule. So, uh, you know, the real cost has to be important if you're a socialist, right? And the real cost is enormous. So that brings up the question of the opportunity cost. And the fundamental fact is that wind and solar are cheaper. And that matters strategically in a market economy because we need to build out clean energy capacity. We need to decarbonize on our way to socialism if we are so lucky as to get there. And it would matter in a socialist economy because though profits wouldn't be the end goal, an efficient use of the society's resources would be. And you know, it, given, given the current numbers, it's, it's pretty hard to see how you could justify spending $29 billion on atomic energy when it's basically, you know, four or five or six times as expensive as wind and solar. And I think you make far too much of, uh, 
of intermittency and this stuff about the geography of hydro. Where are your numbers? I mean, why, why don't you bring this out? I mean, this is just like generalizations. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not at all convinced that that there would be some sort of limit on that we're anywhere near approaching the limit of that geography. You can have dual use reservoirs, um, and we're going to have to have that with less ice packs. And there's also the declining cost of batteries and uh, and the the increased um, power of them. And then there's also the question of the grid. We have an incredibly clapped out grid. That's one thing that deregulation really exacerbated was the kind of profiteering and asset stripping of the U.S. grid. So in a continental sized economy like this, that in of its, the size of our economy helps deal with intermittency to some extent, right? We can shift power from one location to the other. There's molten salt uh, as a technology, which is already being used. It's very expensive. Um, Ivanpah concentrated solar uses that. So this idea that intermittency is this like uh, impossible that all this crisis that only atomic power can deal with, it's not true. And uh, the sad fact is that atomic power can't come out, can't come in on time and on budget to deal with that. Now, in terms of Bosker's question, I'm actually, um, yeah, I, I'm not in favor of closing precipitously closing existing nuke plants if it leads to building out coal uh, gas fired plants, right? But you'd have to do that on a case by case basis. So you've got like um, um, uh, Bassey Davis in Ohio, which seems to be a pretty, uh, like a pretty ramshackle new plant. This is the plant that required a billion point one dollars in subsidies that led to this massive um, scandal that just broke where by first energy wanted 150 million dollars a year to subsidize the operation of this already built plant and so they bribed the speaker of the house in ohio to get it um so that and the reason they need so much money to keep that plant online is because it's basically falling apart other old plants you know um not so bad i mean indian point is right near new york city that that means there's you know it's pretty high risk if something really bad happens, but it's like two gigawatts of power. If it could be run properly while there's sufficient uh, clean energy build out, renewable energy build out, and I would not want to precipitously close uh, Indian Point in answer to that question of yours. And in terms of the build out, I mean, the French build out in, in 1970 was totally socialized. What was that about? That was not about making money and that was not even about the, 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 the maximizing economic resources. That was about geostrategic concerns, right? There's the Arab oil embargo and France is hit by the energy crisis and they realize, okay, what we can do with atomic power, Japan does the same thing because Japan has very limited oil resources at that time and still does. And they realize, okay, we can subsidize the energy sector with wealth produced in the rest of the economy and we'll have expensive energy, but it will be geostrategically safe. No one can cut off our fuel supply. So that's why these really, really high priced atomic power systems were built out in France and Japan. And it, it makes a geostrategic sense. At that time, wind and solar were absolutely in their infancy. And uh, now we have cost competitive clean energy that offers that same element, which is that you can't have your, your uh, energy source hijacked by a hostile power. So, so um, I guess, Lee, why don't you go ahead for, for, for two minutes, uh, then we'll have Christian wrap up for, for two minutes. The questions and comments are, are great, but they're very polarized. They're from people who already have their opinions. So I think I'll let you two talk. And if, if you miss anything that seems glaring or seem especially important, I will ask a question, but, but it seems like uh, there's there's no real real need for you. So so just two minutes, uh, Lee, and, and and then after that, Christian, you could just jump in as soon as uh, as soon as uh, I, you're you're ready. So the the argument that uh, again that we don't have time for socialism or even doses of socialism um, argue is exactly for uh, to build up nuclear is exactly the same argument that um, the right says we don't have time for a green new deal. We don't have time to wait for socialism. Um, well, you know, it's not full socialism, but it's certainly social democracy. And um, I think the great danger of what 
uh, what Christian is doing here is he's assuming that the situation, the current situation in the United States is the same situation for everybody everywhere in the world. When uh, the United States, and this happens over and over again, as somebody who, who, who lives in Canada, I'm constantly, well, you know, that's the argument that people make around Medicare as well. Um, we have it in Canada and uh, we haven't had full communism yet, but you know, um, these things are absolutely doable. I don't care that France did it and Germany uh, and Japan uh, decarbonized their their uh, their or largely decarbonized their their grids as a result of an oil crisis. People didn't know about climate change at the time. The, it simply doesn't matter. Uh, the point is how fast they were able to do it. That's the crucial thing. And sp and time is of the essence right now. Um, and. Uh, what was against? Oh, yeah. In terms of the cost, I've already given you the figures to show how it's cheaper. Uh, so I don't know how, why you're banging this drum. In terms of um, the the geography, you could build hydroelectric in the prairies, the flat prairies or Midwest. Where are the mountain valleys there? Um, so, like you, ha you have to be geographically sensitive. Um, hydroelectric does not work everywhere. Um, neither does pump storage hydro. Uh, geothermal is a similar thing. Geothermal is great. It's renewable. It's 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 available twenty four seven. It's dispatchable. It's not nuclear, but you have to be in a geologically active area for, uh, to to make use of uh, of it. You can extend the the geography somewhat by using enhanced geothermal systems, but that it, it requires something called hy uh, hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, which I believe most of the anti nuclear people are opposed to. So that's not really an option for them either. In terms of the high risk stuff about um, in Indian Point, um, nuclear is, sorry, I shouldn't roll my eyes. Christian, I think you're great, sorry. Um, um, it, it's just, it, it's not true. Nuclear is the safest energy source anywhere in uh, uh, in the world. Um, Kale, if you could put up the last um, slide there of the deaths per uh, kilowatt hour. So uh, this is from New York uh, State Water Resources Institute. If you look at uh, the middle uh, column there, you can see the mortality rate at deaths uh, per trillion kilowatt hours produced. Coal obviously is appalling, uh, so is oil and natural gas. Biofuel is surprisingly uh, awful too. Um, and what's that down there at the bottom? Uh, nuclear, and that includes uh, Chernobyl, which uh, let's remember, Chernobyl was not the result of nuclear, but the result of a decrepit, um, uh, dying Stalinist uh, regime. Um, um, and even, you know, the, the director of the HBO series Chernobyl um, uh, telling that story in a really great, compelling way. He's not anti-nuclear. He's pro-nuclear. He's anti-Stalinist. Um, and that's the thing that we have to have to keep in mind. Um, uh, in uh, a Three Mile Island, you know how many people were killed? Zero. How many people were killed uh, in Fukushima? Zero. Uh, more people were killed as a result of an irrational, unnecessary evacuation. Uh, thousands of people who, you know, uh, were you know yanked off um, um, uh, ventilators or whatever, you know, um, in, in hospitals that didn't need to, or people who died of stress or even suicide as a result of the, uh, the movement. Um, and that is entirely a result of uh, decades of nuclear phobic um, propaganda from the likes of Greenpeace, which itself used nuclear power on its um, it, the ship Yamal, which it used to um, to go into the Arctic to uh, campaign against, rightly campaign against um, diesel oil, sorry, oil exploration. Um, the, uh, when they realized, that, well, I think they knew that it was a, it was a nuclear powered icebreaker. Because icebreakers need a lot of power, nuclear can do that. So, 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 so Lee, Lee, I was about to cut you off, but I feel like you should end on a. I'll give you 10 seconds. You're not okay. ending with talking about an icebreaker. All right. <laughs> uh, well, finally, we need to talk. Just one last thing. We need to talk about the just transition. Nuclear jobs are high skilled, high pay union jobs, much better than $16 an hour slapping solar panels on roofs or stuffing insulation into walls, which also need to be done, by the way. Um, and because of the precision manufacturing required, nuclear has incredible economic multiplier effect. Other high-skilled, high-paid union jobs for, uh, for manufacturing in other sectors, uh, entirely unrelated to nuclear, but also require high precision manufacturing, are attracted to those regions right. with suppliers, uh, uh, where there are the suppliers of nuclear plant machinery. So coal can never do this. Uh, coal can never make America great again, the way that Trump says. And neither can intermittent renewables. 
but nuclear could make America great again. So, so uh, I should say before I pass it off to Christian to, to wrap up for around four minutes or um, to, to finish up that you're both actually advocating the same thing as it relates to uh, not waiting for socialism to do something, right? I mean, in other words, you're both advocating a massive use of carrots and sticks and using public financing, even within the constraints of a, a capitalist economy. Um, I think some of the best work that I've read on this was Christian in, in Dissent magazine, I think, wrote, wrote a couple pieces on 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 this use of um, kind of the, the development state theories as it would relate to something like the, the Green New Deal before the Green New Deal was in circulation. So I think you both agree on the uh, time horizon, what should be done um, uh, strategically, just not what should be invested in, you know, whether whether nuclear should be part of the mix. So I wanted to just uh, give that that caveat, just so Christian focused on the other other things that are rebutting maybe that that portion where I don't think there's actually a, a disagreement between uh, the, the two of you. Neither of you are waiting for for full socialism. Okay, is my mic on? Yeah. You know, I really wish Lee was right about all this because then things wouldn't be as dire as they are. We would be on our way. We would be 20 years into a global nuclear build out. Um, but that's not the case because nuclear power is really expensive. If Cal, if you want to put up, put up that first graph again, if that's easy, you can do that for a second or I can just read it. But it's like, you know, you look at, the fourth line down, solar, photovoltaic, and third line, solar community, fifth line, PV, thin film. You know, look at these prices. And the key one is wind. Look at wind. Look at the price of wind and then look at nuclear. This is the problem, right, globally. This is why plants are being built here and plants are being built there. You can take it down. But we don't have any huge build-out that's been promised for generations now. And, you know, that's why they say atomic power is the energy of the future and it always will be. And Lee sounds very much like somebody from 1954. And I really wish that were the case because the situation is really quite dire. Uh, and so, I, you know, the good news is that we have built the equivalent of 54 atomic power plants in this country over the last 10 years using wind alone. And that, that energy transformation is underway. That's actually happening. And one of the problems with the rhetoric around nukes, which I think is motivated, I mean, I know why people like Cory Booker are into it because it sort of wimp, wimp proofs the green left flank and they're never held accountable because no nukes are built. And I know why states are into it. I mean, you, you have to, if you're going to have a weapons program, you have to have an atomic power sector. You can't, you can't build build weapons without having a whole infrastructure. Uh, but what motivates th this fantasy that this is right around the corner, this is anyway gonna be part of it, I'm not quite sure other than uh, I think what Lee said about, you know, wanting to disabuse the green left of its fear of technology. And I'm down with that, I respect that. I think that's a very good point. But I think atomic power is just the wrong technology. We should be having these difficult arguments about stuff like carbon capture and sequestration, right? We should be having this about uh, rebuilding the grid and uh, you know confronting nimbyism around new power transmission lines, these sorts of things, because nukes just don't get built. There's a handful of plants here or there, but they don't get built. And so then what, what that means is that the real impact intellectually of continually arguing for nukes is that you're basically blocking for the fossil fuel industry. What's going on is a battle to the death in the form of sinking energy prices between wind and solar and natural gas. And coal is getting sloughed off, and this is happening all over the world. And those who disparage wind and solar are essentially on the side of fossil fuels, whether they know it or not. You are essentially running interference for fossil fuels. And what we need to do as leftists and socialists is get behind the transition that's actually happening and encourage policies that will accelerate this transformation and not pretend that there's going to be some sort of, you know, do sex machina at the end of the movie that comes down called nuclear power that saves us and transforms everything. Cause that argument has been made for two generations and it simply does not pan out. 
And it doesn't matter how many greens you name who are into it or any of that. What matters are the costs and the actual numbers of gigawatts being added to, to grids all over the world and atomic power is just not doing it. Not only in this country, but in other countries, even where they're adding plants, it's just like not that many compared to renewable and unfortunately compared to gas. The war, the war is between wind and solar and gas. And if you're an environmentalist, you need to get on the side of wind and solar. And, and this atomic power stuff is really like a displacement of a, a, It's about trying to disabuse greens of their fear of technology. And I respect that. But in and of itself, it's just not happening. So I suggest we return to this subject in 10 years and see what's going on. Since I've been writing about this for over 10 years, it's the same thing. All right, we'll do it in 10 years with the Jacobin VR channel. In the meantime, I just want to thank both of our, our, our guests, Lee Phillips, uh, Christian and we'll do it, and we'll, do it, we'll do it hopefully from state, like state-funded studios run by Clean Power and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, for now, uh, we could catch me and, and Christian. We're we'll going to be talking on the 16th about his uh, new um, uh, Hamilton book. Uh, Lee is gonna is a, is a regular on the channel and, and a regular in Jacobin, so you can read both of their works in Jacobin. For now, I have a date with Jimmy Butler and Antonio Kumpo and the you know NBA playoffs, so I'm gonna be doing that. So I'm gonna just leave it on that note. Uh, please press like, press subscribe, support these guys uh, of work too, and uh, thanks uh, as always to Kale Brooks, our producer. Thank you. Take care. Mm-hmm.